Have a seat. If you're out in the foyer, find a friend, grab them by the arm and say, come on, we got to hear this. God says of his own word, my word is like a fire and like a hammer that smashes the rock in pieces. And we're going to hear it this morning. Amen. Amen. Finish your conversation. Finish your phone call. Finish your cup of coffee. Finish your breath mint. And come on in. Find a friend, find your way, find a seat. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's come on in. Amen, amen, Christ of the nations. Who signed up to go on outreach this summer? Amen, amen. I just want you to know that your Christ for the Nation staff are leading the way. The staff outreach team leaves in just a few weeks. I will take them into the middle of the Amazon jungle. Amen? Amen. And we have a few of you going with us. I see Mariah cheering vigorously down there. Amen. Please help me in welcoming the lovely and talented Miss Jen Bostick. The world does not need cool Christians who are culturally saturated. It needs exiles with the scent of heaven and the aroma of Christ. Good morning, missionaries. So it is the giving season. And in light of the giving season, when we give a gift, we always give our best gift, do we not? We plan and we make it lovely. And then we present it to those that we love because we love them and because we want the best for them. And today that is exactly what we get to present to you. We have a few men and women who are absolutely the best gift. They are a gift to us and today they are a gift to you. For months they have laid before the Lord and asked him for a word for you. And today is your day, and we will get to present the best gift. Amen. This is my wife, Jen Bostick, the Outreaches Coordinator. My name is Adam Bostick. I'm the Institute Missions Manager. Amen. This semester, I had the honor and I had the privilege to teach the homiletics class. Woo! Woo! I have to say, I have been teaching this class in English and in Spanish for 13 years, and I have never had a class this good. I mean, absolutely amazing students that signed up because they wanted to learn it. Students that showed up to that class because they want to take the gospel to the nations and because they're not afraid to proclaim it. And I was just overwhelmed watching their labs, seeing absolutely amazing improvement. Seeing those that tried hard and were nervous and they did their best in the first round and they improved in the second round and so many of them by the third round just blew it out. And I was totally impressed. And so I want to ask you as a student body to give it up this morning for the homiletics class fall 2023.
Now, I also want to encourage you with the word this morning. Some of your fellow students are going to come up. They're going to deliver the word today. They're going to deliver it with boldness. They're going to deliver it in faith. And I want to ask you to remember the words of Jesus this morning, and that is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So when they're preaching good, let them know. Hallelujah. Amen. (laughs) Raise a hand. Jump up on your feet. Make some noise. If they holler at you, holler back because they're about to bring it. So if you would, jump up on your feet, stomp on, make a little bit of noise, clap, and help me to welcome this morning our first preacher, Anna Valivino. Come on up. Good morning. If you guys can, you guys can sit down. Um, as you guys know, my name is Anna Valdivino, as he said. Um, I want to honor Mr. Adam Bostic and Jen Bostic for this opportunity and also CFNI. Can we give it a hand to CFNI, guys? Aren't you glad? Whew. Um, I'm going to start off by asking a quick question for you guys. How many of you guys are good at listening to a beat or anything and you can already tell the music? You can already tell what song it is. Can I see some hands? Are we good with that? Especially musicians. They, they got it like that. Well, but are you guys good at discerning the Lord's voice? As quick as you can discern a song or a music by its beat, can you de- discern the Father's voice by just a word that he says? If you can turn to 1 Samuel 3. Good job, Bible students. Look at you guys with your Bibles. 1 Samuel 3, we're going to be reading from verses 7 to 10. Can I get an amen whenever you're there? That was way too quick. Are you sure you're there? (laughs) Amen. And the word says, now Samuel did not know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not been yet revealed A third time, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord stood there as he was calling like the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel got up and said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. This is one of my favorite passages. So if you guys don't know this about me, as sweet and gentle as I may look, I used to wrestle in high school. (laughs) I didn't know anything. I just knew I just wanted to beat up some boys and I just wanted to be it. So if I can have my volunteer saying, can we give a hand to saying, please? Saying over here is my opponent in my first ever wrestling match. I didn't know what I was doing. Like I said, I just wanted to beat up some boys and that was it for me. I was good with that, but I didn't know any moves, so how can I do that? In my first match, I was just there wrestling, and my coach was screaming at me, and I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know those words. I didn't know. So I started wrestling with him, and I did not know what I was doing. So I was getting beat up. And then out of nowhere, a voice comes from the crowd. And this, and this, voice begins to instruct me and I won my match thank you so much 
<laughs> Who was that voice? That was my father. That from a crowd, he saw that I was losing my match and not understanding a single thing. So he said, let me help my daughter. So he began to instruct me. But how in a room full of people screaming, can I hear the word of my father instructing me? It is because I have intimacy with my father. I have a relationship with my father. I trained my ear to hear my father. So you're wrestling with your, with your fear, with your anxiety, with addictions, but you forgot to listen to your father. And your father is there, daughter, son, you got this. Daughter, son, this is how you do it. But yet you choose to listen to a coach that's standing next to you and babbling at you, screaming at you whenever there's a father speaking to you. There's a difference between screaming and speaking. The Lord is speaking to you this whole entire semester. What is it that you're not listening? The Lord is speaking to you. Why are you not submitting? But to listen to a father, to know a voice, to truly know a voice, you need to have intimacy. There's no way I would have known that was my father if that was just a random person. A voice that is distant, a voice that is unfamiliar to me. And then there's the ones that do know the Father's voice, but they're not following. And it's insane because I was reading the word and in John 10, 27 say, my sheep know my voice. I know them, they follow me. So let's back, let's back it up. You know his voice, you hear his voice. He knows you, you know him. Why are you not following him? Because it says, they follow me. They hear me and then they follow me. Where's the following part? Because as my father was speaking to me, I was following his directions. I was following through what he was saying. So what is it that you're waiting for? And then there's people here that are like, why is he sitting in a crowd? Isn't he my father supposed to be next to me? You have placed him in a crowd. You have placed him on the bleachers because you're so concerned with the people surrounding you, with your friends, with other voices that you left your father at the bleachers. Because from that day on, my second match, he was right at my corner because my coach said, he, she listens to you. So I began to listen. Now Samuel did not know the voice of the Lord. It had not been revealed to him. That's why he went to his coach, Eli, to the authority figure that he, he knew, the only one. Now what calls my attention the most is that Samuel is in a place where the presence of the Lord moves consistently. It's always there, yet it had not been revealed to him. You can be a CFNI and not know the Father's voice. You can be at church and not know the Father's voice. You can be in a missions field and not know the voice of the Father. Because it is not the place, it's about the revelation that you receive and it's personal. How does your Father speak personally to you? It, he doesn't speak the same to me that he speaks to my dad, that he speaks to my teachers. He doesn't. How does your father speak to you? It is so necessary that we go into our intimate place. The Bible says, if you don't want to believe me, believe the Bible. It says, close your door and seek him. Go to your intimate place, close your door and seek him. Why are you not seeking? It's been a whole semester. What are you waiting for? You're a first, second, third year. What are you waiting for? 
you're struggling with your anxiety and you're like, what am I going to do after CFNI? Am I doing another semester? And your father's like, duh, I didn't tell you otherwise. Yes, this is the way I'm guiding you. But then you want to listen to your pastor that offers you a good opportunity, but that is not from the Lord. But then you want to hear the, the things, the just people talking. And you're like, dang, I actually don't know if I'm staying at CFNI. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. So what is it? What is the fear that you're wrestling with? That your father is just right there. Your father is just right here up front cheering for you, instructing you. That day, it marked my life. Not because I won a match, but because I understood the deep meaning of having my father next to me. And then there's those that don't have a father and don't know the voice even at home. How am I supposed to know this cloud father? Intimacy. He, re he already revealed himself. And that is the Bible. He already revealed himself. It's on your hands. If the Bible is not enough for you, it doesn't speak in a level what else do you want? If the Bible is not enough for you to seek him, to understand, to reveal, oh, I've read it so many times, I don't need it. Samuel could have been like, he has called me so many times, I don't need to get up one more time. He has called me so many times, I don't need to get up. Samuel did not give up. For the third time, he got up. And he went to Eli, his authority. What are the voices that you're listening to? Because Eli at least guided Samuel, even in his nonsense, and said, the Lord is trying to speak to you. Say, I'm here. Speak for your servant is listening. If your friend is telling you that intimacy is not good, it's not a priority in your life, you need to check your friends. You need to check the people that are speaking to your life and guiding you. There's no way the Lord doesn't want to speak to you. Because he's constantly speaking. He's constantly speaking. So as you go about this, this service, I want you to turn in. You're listening ears on and lean into the Father. Lord, what do you want to speak to me as a father? As my classmates come here, what is he speaking to you? What does he want to reveal to you? Guys, we can go three years in here and not listen to a single thing he says. And that is so sad. That's sad. We can listen to chapel. We can listen to cha chapel. Anything that you want, lecture, and not get a single revelation because we're used to the place. We're connected. These CFNI, as much as I love CFNI, it's not my roots. And it shouldn't be yours too. It is the Father. I'm rooted with my Father. What are you rooted in? That once CFNI may be stricken away from you or, or just removed. Is your identity, is your battles going to keep going? Is everything else that you have built this three years, two years, one year, is just going to go away? Tune in to the Father's voice. Know his voice because he wants to speak to you. At the end, we're doing an altar call. And I want you guys not to just answer to an altar call, but answer to your father. Amen. 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 I'll 
if you guys can give a hand, which you already are, to Ben Shepard. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It is. Thank you so much. Glory to God. It is such an honor and genuine pleasure to get the opportunity to speak to each and every one of you guys today. Um, do a favor for me real quick. Turn to your neighbor and tell them the one thing that you're going to miss most on campus over this Christmas break, over the holiday break. I'll give you 15 seconds. Wow. That's incredible. Thank you, guys. Hey, the thing that I'm going to miss most over the break is each and every one of your beautiful faces. Let's give a hand clap for all of the CFNI students. <laughs> yeah. And since I won't be able to see you guys over Christmas, I wanted to invite you into my Christmas festivities and share a little bit of what I like to do on Christmas Day, and that is share stories of the glory of God and what he's done in my life. So open your Bibles, whether they're physical or digital. We're gonna be in the living word today. And wave it up to me whenever you got it. There you go, hallelujah. Today we are going to be reading out of 2 Kings chapter one. We're gonna be a little bit all over the chapter today. So just turn to 2 Kings chapter one. One, and just for the sake of time today, I'll be paraphrasing a bit, so I highly, highly encourage you to go back and read the entirety of it for yourself. But essentially what's going on in Second Kings is there is this king over Israel, and his name is Ahaziah. He is the son of Ahab and Jezebel. Can I get a boo for Ahab and Jezebel? Boo. <laughs> they are evil, evil kings. And this king Ahaziah, their son, he's instated as king, and the first thing that he ever does is fall through a grate on his balcony, scrape up his leg, and get infected. So this guy's on his deathbed, he's deathly ill. And so he sends out these messengers to go and consult Beelzebub, prince of the demons, god of Ekron, to see if he's gonna recover from this injury. And so he sends these messengers out with this word, and meanwhile, the prophet Elijah is just chilling on a hilltop somewhere, and he receives word from the spirit of the Lord, and he says, hey, these messengers are going out, you gotta go and confront them, and say, is it because there's no God in Israel that you consult Beelzebub, God of Ekron? Because of this, you shall never recover, you shall surely die. And so these messengers go back with this new word from Elijah, and I can just imagine their hesitancy as they creak open those heavy doors and step into the throne room and have to stand before the king and be like, hey, we got a word uh, from the sky. He said, is it because there's no God in Israel that you consult Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, therefore you'll surely die? Like it's, it's not good news. And so the king Ahaziah eventually figures out that this man who's prophesying over him is the prophet Elijah. Can I get the prophet Elijah to run up just as quickly as you can? Hallelujah. Let's give a hand clap for Elijah. Oh, oh, Elijah, Elijah, grab your fire. Grab your fire. Hey, hey. Thank you, sir. So Elijah is planted up on his hilltop. And Ahaziah has had enough of this. This is the same man that tormented my father with righteousness and the word of God, so I'm putting an end to this man. So what he decides to do, and we pick up in verse nine, it says, then Ahaziah sent to Elijah a captain with his company of 50 men. Do we have a captain here? Oh, here comes the captain. A captain is sent up to Elijah. And this is what happens here. The captain went up to Elijah who was sitting on top of the hill and says to him, man of God, the king says, come down. And Elijah answered the captain, if I am a man of God, may fire come from heaven and consume you and your mighty men. And then fire <laughs> fell from heaven and consumed him and his mighty men. Hey. So Ahaziah, he receives word of this. And so he decides to move on to the next step of his plan. In verse 11, at this, the king sent to Elijah another captain with his 50 men. Oh, oh, what's up, captain? And then, and then we read on, we read on. The captain says to him, man of God, this is what the king says, come down at once. And Elijah said, if I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And then fire once again fell from heaven 
and consumed him and his 50 men. Y'all, that is 102 men dead on the ground. So Ahaziah, he decides that he needs to devise a new master plan. So we read on and we see what he does. So the king sent a third captain with his 50 men. Oh, here he comes. Wait, wait, captain, wait, captain. He sent the third captain. The third captain went up and fell on his knees before Elijah. Man of God, he begged, please have respect for my life and the lives of these 50 men, your servants. See, fire has fallen from heaven and consumed the first, consumed the first two captains and all their men, but now have respect for my life. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him, do not be afraid. So Elijah got up and went down with him to the king. And as they go down to the king, go ahead and give a hand clap for our mighty men. And Elijah, wonderful job. Thank you guys so much. Awesome, thank you so much. Now, this is one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament. And at first glance, it seems like a story of God's sovereignty and his wrath and his power and his might. But if we dig in a little deeper, I'd like to propose to you today that this is a story of submission. And I'd like to bring a message before you today entitled, Surrender Your Sword. You see, it's easy to think of Elijah's submission and how he was so submissive to the word of the Lord and he heard him so, so attentively, or Ahaziah's lack of submission and how that led to his downfall. But I propose to you that the most powerful example of submission in this story is that of the third captains. See, there were three things that the third captain had to do in order to not be consumed. Take heed, if you do not submit to the word of the Lord your God, you will be consumed by the things of this world. And the first thing he had to do was he had to recognize his wrongful rulers. Because you see, from a young age, these men, they weren't born as generals. They were raised up in the camps of Israel with a sword in one hand and a shield in the other. And to get into that position, they were the very best at what they did. They were the best of the fighting men. And so that became their identity. And that became what they were comfortable with. And under the authority of the king, they had to answer to his every back and call. So if he said go to the high places, they would climb to the top of the mountains. And if he said go to the low places, then they would go to the bottom of the valleys. So when this third captain is called by Ahaziah to go out and capture Elijah and do with him whatever Ahaziah wishes, he answers to the authority of the king. And he steps out with that authority in the back of his mind and in his hand, the comfort of his identity, but whenever he comes before the hill that the man of God sits upon, he begins to recognize the gigantic gap in authority between the ruler of this world and the ruler of heaven and earth that stands before him in glory on that mountain. And in that moment, he recognizes that what he's holding in his hand is not sufficient. And so he has to loosen his grip and surrender his sword. So many of us have voices that are speaking over us because if we are not submitted and if we are not solid in the authority of the Lord in our lives, then we'll turn to the first voice that gives us any sense of direction. He was going on the word of the king and he knew what was comfortable. What are you holding on to that is your comfort, your identity, that you've grown up using as your only source of offense and defense? Some of us have been holding on to isolation for so long that anytime anybody tries to approach you, you cling to your sword and you say, no, I'm fine, man. I'm having a good day. I'm doing all right. But people are trying to come to you with love and share the love of God with you and you're shutting it down. Some of you are so absorbed with hurt and scars that people have given to you and you cling fast to that hatred that is the only thing that you think can defend you and you keep swinging it around, it's just so you don't have to confront the hurt that is in your heart. God is calling you to surrender your sword and lay it down here today. The second thing the captain had to do was he had to kneel before his king. He'd lay down his sword, his identity, the voices were out of mind. And in that moment, he got down on his knees he said, please, man of God, have respect for my life, for the lives of these men. Please have mercy on me, spare me. 
And can I tell you that the moment that he began to submit was the moment that the word of the Lord began speaking to Elijah. Whenever you begin to submit, the Lord will begin to speak in your life. Whenever you lay down your sword that you've grasped so tightly, whenever you throw the other voices to the side and say, Lord, I am relying on you. And whenever you kneel and submit and create intimate time set apart for the Lord your God, he will speak to you. The third And arguably the hardest thing that the captain had to do was he had to walk in the word. You see, Elijah had the manifest presence of the Lord on him. So whenever Elijah walks down from this mountain and climbs down and meets the general, this general is standing before in the presence of the Lord. And he recognizes in this moment that he's been spared. He could run away. He could go hide in a hole somewhere. He could abandon his assignment and he would be free, but he would be living in cowardice for the rest of his life, knowing that the enemy is still on the attack. So what he decides to do is he decides to take a step and another step and another step, walking all the way with the spirit of the Lord right next to him. And he knew where he was going. He knew that he was walking into the same circumstances with the same rulers, the same authorities, the same evil king. He knew that the situation had not changed, but something had changed within him. And so he could walk boldly into that throne room and he didn't have to announce himself. He didn't have to say, here I am, here is Elijah, the presence of the Lord. No, he simply just stood back. And guess what Elijah did? He stepped forward and said, surely you will die. And then surely he died. Can I tell you, the Lord is speaking a better word over you, and some of you guys strive so hard to stand in your own defense when the Lord is just calling you to simply sit back and let him fight for you. The Lord, your God, is speaking a better word over you. So for those of you today who feel like you've been holding on tightly to the things that have comforted you in the past and you don't know how to let them go, for those of you who feel like there are voices speaking over you and you can't seem to get them out of your mind, For those of you who want to kneel before the Lord and have a true and intimate moment and feel him in a way that you never have before. And for those of you who want to rely more strongly on the Lord, at the end of this service, we are going to give an altar call. And if you desire, you will come to the front and you will meet the Lord here. And you will surrender your sword. Thank you so much. Hey, welcome up with me, Brianna Casino. Good morning. For those of you who do not know me and for those who do not remember what he said, my name is Brianna Casino. And and it's an honor to be with you here today. Thank you, Mr. Bostick, for this opportunity. It is truly my honor, my privilege. Thank you, CFNI, for believing in us and giving us room to grow in our gifts. So thank you, truly. So can I see a raise of hands for all my public school kids? Come on. (laughs) So I feel like we're going to be able to relate a bit better. And I feel like those who are not will be able to understand us on a bit of a deeper level today. So you know those days when your teacher's absent and his sub walks into the room? You know immediately what type of day it's going to be. You know, when a teacher walks in, and they were probably a science teacher for 40 years, but now they're subbing, man, you know they're strict, and you're not getting away with anything, so you're not pulling anything. But you know those subs that come in, you know they're not strict, probably just graduated college, man, 15-minute bathroom breaks, you're on your phone, kids are taking naps in the back of the classroom. I'm not saying this is good, but this is a reality of public school, right? So, on a bit of a different note, today we're going to be speaking about a topic that's actually encompassed in the title of the message, which is um, the revelation that shifts your identity. The passage of scripture that we will be in is the book of Matthew, chapter 16, starting at verse 13, if you guys could go there. The book of Matthew, chapter 16, beginning at verse 13. Now, as you go there, to give you some context... In this scripture, we see Jesus asking the disciples some questions. And what I love about this is that when God asks you a question, it's not because he wants to know the answer. It's because he wants you to be aware of the answer. So let's see what he asks them. 
The word says, now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So you see that Jesus asks them two questions. Peter has a revelation of Jesus as Messiah, and then Jesus gives him his very own authority. Keep this at the forefront of your mind as we go through each of these questions. The first question, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Who in this room knows that the world has a lot to say about everything? There's not a topic under the sun that's not inundated with a myriad of opinions from the world. And if you are not confident in what you believe, you will be tossed to and fro by the opinions of the world around you. But then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that the son of man is? Who is Jesus to you? And this is a question I believe every person will be confronted with at some point in their lives. I believe that when you stand before the father, he's not going to say, well, what did you do for my church? He's going to say, what did you do with my son? What did you do with the cross? So Peter has this revelation and then Jesus gives him his authority. Well, what does it mean to have authority? What does it mean to walk in authority? Well, I think of a police officer. If I'm driving my vehicle and I see a police officer standing like this, what I'm not going to do is drive around the police officer. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to stop. Why? Is it because the police officer is stronger than me in my vehicle? No, it's because he has the authority to tell me to stop. And now it's not the authority in the individual, it's the authority in the department that the individual is under. You see, there's a police department and they have a guideline of rules, regulations and whatnot. And as long as the police officer is operating within this, he has the authority to make decisions and has the police department to back him up. Now, it's the same thing with Christ. When you have a revelation of Jesus, and when you come under the lordship of Jesus Christ, now you have his authority and you have the kingdom of heaven to back you up on your decisions. So, like I said earlier with the substitute teacher, if a substitute is not confident in their identity or in their authority over you, even though they have the school department backing them up, Man, we can sniff that out. And we know exactly what we could get away with. And if you are not confident in your identity or in your authority, the devil could sniff that out and knows what he could get away with with you. And we can see an example of this in the book of Acts of a group of people that were not confident in their identity or not walking in true authority. Uh, It is in the book of Acts, chapter 19, and it says that there were seven Jewish exorcists going from place to place, attempting to name the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. And it says that they said, I adjure you by Jesus of whom Paul preaches. Who preaches? Paul? Not them. Why are they trying to cast out devils in the name of Jesus if they don't even believe in Jesus? It's because they want his power without being under his authority. You see, authority only comes when you're under the authority of Jesus Christ. So how do we do this practically? Well, for one, you need a revelation of Jesus for yourself. You know, it's time that we stop living off of the revelation from our parents, from our professors, from our friends. 
We need to know him for ourselves. You see, when the Jewish exorcists were trying to cast out the evil spirit from the revelation of Paul, it says that the evil spirit sent them away naked and bleeding. Friends, we need to know him. So a way you could do this is the next time you read the word of God, Old Testament, New Testament, I want you to ask Holy Spirit, reveal Jesus to me. Second thing, cultivate intimacy. I want you to set aside a night every week and you're gonna have a date night with Jesus. I do this. We, <laughs> we read the word together. We even have our favorite snack together. And if anyone knows me, they would know that I love acai bowls. And I think Jesus loves them too. I talk to him, I tell him all about my day. And this is a way that we could come together and I could learn who he is. Friends, we can't know him if we don't spend time with him. And the third thing, you need to memorize the word of God. The word of God needs to be written on the tablets of your heart so that when situations arise, it's not at that point that we run to the word, but it's that point that the word of God so deeply embedded in us that it comes up and bubbles out. And when you speak, that situations change and atmosphere shift. And it's because you're not speaking from your authority, but the authority of the word of God. And I believe that I'm looking at a room of leaders who seek after him, that know his voice, that are willing to submit and then can step into the authority. So if Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart right now and you feel this burning in your heart that you want to know him more, you want to be more firmly rooted in identity, you want to be able to walk in the authority that Jesus paid such a high price for, I want you to allow Holy Spirit into that area and at the end of this service, we're going to have a time of prayer. And you can come up, and I believe that Holy Spirit will mark you, and you will be changed for the rest of your life. So if you can all join me, and stand up, and welcome Sang to the platform. Good morning, everyone. I am so excited to be here, and it is an honor to share the word of God with you all this morning. And I would like to say thank you and honor Ms. Uh, Pastor Adam Bostick and Jim Bostick, and thank you for the Lindsay family. And there's um, a woman who always pray for me and always um, tell about the word of God to me. And my mom is here in the building as well. Would you stand up, mom? And my brother is here as well. My friend, would you guys all stand up, please? Would you all stand up? There they are. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, you may be wondering who is this seven-foot-tall guy up here. Well, my name is Sang. And yes, I cannot sing a song, but I sang for Jesus. Amen? Amen. And I may look small, but the God that I serve, he's big and he's the almighty powerful God. And this morning, we are going to dive into his mighty word. Are you guys so excited and ready to receive? If you are, I want you to touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, get ready to receive. Amen, amen, amen. We are still currently in fall season. It is one of my favorite seasons of all time. How many of you guys love fall season? Well, that's a lot of you guys. That's a lot of you guys. The reason why I love fall season so much is that fall is a season for letting things go. 
tree let go of the leaf, bird let go of the habitat and move to the south, and we let go of summer. So today my title is called Let Go. Let it go. And the Bible verse that I choose is Genesis chapter 19, verse 23 and 26, but I'll be focusing on 26. So come on, Bible school student, turn with me to Genesis chapter 19, verse 26. In today's message, we are going to look at the passage in the scripture where the importance of letting go is magnified. We are going to learn about the step that we can take to let go of what's holding us down. So that we can follow our heavenly father with reckless abandon. And before I dive into the word of God, I would like to share a little bit about the context. And I believe that all of you guys have read and know the story about Lot and his family where they have to run away from the city of Sodom. Because God will destroy that city with fire. The reason why is people in that city were sinning before God and do a lot of things that is against God's will. And God will destroy that city with fire. And God told Lot and his family to run away. As they run away, God told them to not look back. But what happened was in verse 26. Lot's wife was following behind him. She looked back at the city. When she did, she became a pillar of salt. The reason why she became a pillar of salt is because she could not let go of her city. People that she loved, things that she owned, the animal that she used to take care of, she could not resist it, so she turned back. As soon as she turned back, she became a pillar of salt. And that's a very sad moment for Lot and his two daughters. That they have to keep running for their life and their mothers left behind and be, she became a pillar of salt. Very sad moment. She became a pillar of salt. And the first point that I want you to receive is this. If you don't let go, you are destined for destruction. When we fail to let go of things that in our life, they're hindering us. We are destined for destruction. And this might sound a little bit harsh, but it is true. Letting go is not easy. It is one of the hardest things that we ever have to decide. But it becomes possible when we understand why it is necessary to let go. The reason Lord and uh, Lord wife and her family were in that situation, they were that is having to flee Sodom is because their presence, reality was destined for destruction. It was time for them to cut their loses and let it go. And the same is true for us today. Sometimes we are holding on to things that God already declares are over. Sometimes we are holding on to things or people in our life that we know in our spirit are not in line with God's will in our life. And this morning, I have a backpack with me. And this bottle, a water bottle up here. This backpack represents your life and my life. This bottle represents things that we put into our life. Sometimes we put things in our life that lead us down and lead us to destruction. We put resentment. We put bitterness. Angers, addiction, unforgiveness, fears. All of these things, we put them into our life. And what you do with those things is this. You put them into your life and you carry them wherever you go as you pursue your dream, as you climb to the top of the mountain in life. As you try to do what God told you to do, you carry them wherever you go. Can I tell you something this morning? The longer you carry, the heavier it gets. It may start small. The longer you carry, the bigger it gets, the heavier it gets, the harder for it, it becomes. It will drain you. And lastly, it will lead you to destruction. 
But if you want to avoid destruction and the pain and heartache, then you need to let it go. You need to take it up and you need to lay everything down at the feet of Jesus. If you want to move ahead, you need to be careful about what God said. And God is already saying it's over. The part of your life is over. Practicing bad habits, those are over. The addiction, worries, and fear that owns you, those are over. The story is already been written. Jesus already paid the price. You know it's over. But I have a question for you this morning. Is it over now? Is it over now? You already know what those things can do to your life. Whether it is an addiction, unforgiveness, or person that you love, or things. Whatever it is, you know what you need to let go of. And if you, and you also know that if you keep those things into your life, it will lead you to destruction. But it doesn't have to. You can let it go today. You can lay everything down at the feet of Jesus today. The choice is yours. The decision is yours. And the second thing that I want you to receive is this. Listen carefully. If you want to let go, you cannot be salty. You cannot be salty. Do not be like, look, wife. She looked back and she became salty. And the word of God says she became a pillar of salt. Perhaps that's why some of you guys are so salty. Because you keep looking back at what was and what could have been instead of what is and what will be. Don't let your past relationship make you salty. Don't let someone who hurt you or someone who looked down on you cause you become hard and cold. Lord wife looked back and consequently she became paralyzed and could not move forward. Do you know that you become salty when anger and bitterness and resentment set inside of you? Can I ask you a question this morning? Have you ever met someone or seen someone and wonder why he is so bitter or why he is so hard before you haven't done anything to them? Have you ever met someone like that? That's a lot of you, okay. The reason why is because something has happened in the past and then they are still stuck there. They were hurt before and they're still carrying the heavy weight. And they are telling themselves that I'm not going to let anyone else come close to me again. I'm not going to let anyone else hurt me again. Time has passed, but they haven't. It happened years ago, but in their mind, it feels like it happened yesterday. I want all of you guys to stand on your feet. This is the point that I want to encourage you this. Listen carefully. Do not be like that person who stays salty. Do not stay salty. Do not let bitterness, anger, fastness in your heart. Instead, let go of what was in the past and move forward and towards what God has for you. And brother and sister, trust me. What is behind you is not nearly as great as what God has stored for you ahead. God has a great thing for you. But in order for you to receive it, you must first let go of what you are holding on to. Or you must let go of what something that is holding you down. You got to let it go. You got to let it go. God did not design you to carry a heavy weight. God did not design you to carry a heavy burden. God designed you to walk in peace. God designed you to be in his presence day and night. There are some people in this room today that are carrying a heavy weight, a heavy burden, and you are wondering why you couldn't worship the Lord, why you couldn't spend time in the secret place. 
because you are carrying a heavy weight today. And I want you to make a decision right now to come to the altar to lay everything down at the feet of Jesus. I want you to make a decision. Come on down. Come on down. Even if you're a small thing or a big thing, lay it down to the altar. Lay it down. Lay it down. Lay it down. Do not leave Christ with a nation. Do not leave. Do not go to winter break without letting go of every single thing. Even if you're a small thing or a big thing. Do not leave this place without laying everything down at the feet of Jesus. Do not carry those heavy weight into 2024. Do not, do not, do not. Let it go. Do not give space to the enemy. Let it go, let it go, let it go. Bitterness has to go. Unforgiveness has to go. Addiction has to go. If you are hearing other voice rather than God, that has to go. That has to go. Resentment has to go. If there's anything that is stopping you from worshiping the Lord, that has to go. That has to go. Let it go. Let it go. Come to the altar. If you are not coming to the altar, move out of your comfort zone and start to pray. pray start to pray. Start to pray. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. It may look small, but it will it will let you lead you to destruction. It doesn't have to. I want you to start praying. In spirit, if you have the prayer language, I want you to start praying. In the name of Jesus, let it go. Let it go. Brother and sister, it, it's not worth it to carry those weight. Jesus already carried for you. God did not desire you to carry those weight. Let it go. Let it go. Do not take those weight into 2024. Let it go. In the name of Jesus. Freedom in the house. Freedom. I speak Jesus. I speak the name of Jesus over every other fears, addiction. Out in the name of Jesus. Out in the name of Jesus. You have three minutes. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. Use your voice. This is how you fight the devil. Do not give space in the name of Jesus. Cast out in the name of Jesus. Bitterness out in the name of Jesus. Resentment out in the name of Jesus. Born addiction out in the name of Jesus. Kuraka pashika tepo. Ungaraka pashika tereshinede. Pray, pray, pray. Prayer is the weapon. This is how you fight. This is how you let go. Let it go. Let it go. You have two minutes. Keep on praying. Kusaka paraka tepo shika tereshinede. Urakate parakate po. In the name of Jesus. Freedom. New revelation. New vision in the name of Jesus. Urakate po shika tereshinede. In the name of Jesus, I cancel every demonic assignment that was upon the student body. I break them off in the name of Jesus. As they go back to winter break, that they will not fall back. That they will not look back in the past, but they will move forward and toward to you, God. I break every arrow that was upon the student body in the name of Jesus right now. I break it off. I break it off. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, God desires you to walk in freedom. 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 Fresh touch of heaven. Fresh touch of heaven in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, come on, keep on praying in your spirit. In your spirit. Do not leave this place without laying down. Even if a small thing. Come on, student. 
that small thing can lead you to destruction, do not let that small thing stay. Let it go in the name of Jesus. Power in the name of Jesus. Raka pashika tepo. Kusaka paraka tapa. Uka shika tepo roko shika Pastor, evangelist, missionary, you guys are the one. Do not leave people without letting go, letting go of those things. Do not, do not tempt to leave people. You got to let it go in the name of Jesus. If you need prayer, we are here to pray for you. If you need healing, come on now. Come on now. Do not be shy to come down. Do not be ashamed to let go. Jesus already paid the price. He wasn't shy. He wasn't ashamed when he carried that cross for you. In the name of Jesus. This is a holy moment right now. If you need to go, you are dismissed. That's the end of class. You are dismissed. But we're not going to break up this holy moment. Those of us that can stay are going to stay and we're going to pray. If you need to let it go, come up here. If you need to draw close to God, come up here. If you need to know God's voice. If you have doubts inside of yourself, whether you really and truly know his voice, come on up. I believe that you're going to hear it today. The Holy Spirit has been planning this moment for months. So we are here. in the hearts of each and every man and woman in, in this building, Lord Jesus. I thank you that you are leading us back into intimacy, Father. I thank you for the strength that you have given us to walk in the steps that you have allotted for us, Lord God. And I thank you here today that we are determining that we will not let anything stand in our way, Lord Jesus. Every hurdle that lays in front of us and everything that we have left behind, Lord Jesus, it shall not trip us up on this walk to pursue you. I thank you, Jesus, for the love that you have so consistently poured out into our hearts, Lord God. And we can walk in boldness and say, the Lord my God has always been on my side. So Lord Jesus, we lay it down here today, Father. We return back to submission. Each and everything that we're clutching onto for our own safety, Lord Jesus, we lay it down at your feet. Jesus, Lord God, we came here only for you, and we continue to pursue you fervently day after day. And I thank you, Jesus, that as we lean into you, and as your spirit pours out into us, Lord Jesus, that you are making it all simple, for your yoke is easy, and your burden is light, Lord Jesus, as we are filled and refilled and refilled day after day, Lord Jesus, that the things that seem so important before begin to fall away. I thank you, Father, for clarifying what you intend us to do. I thank you, Jesus, for working in our minds and our hearts to guide our steps, Father God. I thank you, Lord, that you are the ultimate authority, that there is no one beside you. There is no one like you, Lord. So every voice that is spoken over us, every lie that is spoken, false identity, we break it off here at your feet, Jesus. We lay it down before you. We won't cling to the things that we held on to before. Jesus, I thank you for calling us back to intimacy, Lord. I thank you for our date nights with you, 
for the times that we have to spend alone with you in your presence in our prayer closets, Lord Jesus. I thank you that you make yourself abundantly evident when you step in, Lord Jesus. I pray that we would not question the spirit of the Lord in the room, but Lord Jesus, that we would see you move in power each and every time you step in, even for the remainder of the semester, Lord Jesus. I pray it would be a switch, a fire falling onto this room, Lord Jesus, as we enter in and obediently worship you, Lord Jesus, that you would be faithful to come and come into our hearts and renew us, Lord Jesus, that we don't have to dwell on the things of the past, but we can rejoice in where you have delivered us. In Jesus' name. Jesus, we thank you for who you are. Jesus, we thank you that we have the privilege and the honor to know who you are. I thank you that there's a call to intimacy today. There is a call to come and get marked by the power of the Holy Spirit that will leave us changed and shifted for the rest of our lives. Jesus, have your way. Have your way, have your way in our lives. Have your way. Our bridegroom is calling us. The bridegroom is calling you. calling you answer him answer the call Jesus we love you Jesus we cherish you mark us with your fire mark us with your love Father singing 